holy, holy. Yeah, yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Every bit of that, every bit of that are statements of faith. Hallelujah. I'm going to push my way up the mountain. No matter what, no matter what, what kind of evidence or what kind of thoughts or whatever, I'm going to push my way up the mountain regardless. I'm going to, I'm going to spite, I'm going to speak in spite of the circumstances. I'm going to let the Lord glorify himself in my life in spite of whatever the the enemy tries to throw at me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God and believe God and follow God and display God and grab a knot and hang on and let the Lord do everything in my life that he wants to do and needs to do in spite of how things might look. That's faith, as a matter of fact. That's exactly a wonderful description of faith in the life of, of a believer uh, that in spite of uh, whatever evidence may exist, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, uh, my faith says I'm going to believe what God says. Uh, it doesn't matter what else might be there. Uh, faith believes in spite of uh, physicalities that God is in control and that God has uh, allowed things or God has ushered things into our life in order to challenge us to be mature, to grow, to experience life. And that's the, that's the seventh fruit of this, on this tree of the Spirit of God, we've spent six weeks in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And uh, you may have to help me, Nay, because I, I don't think my clicker's clicking here. Because um, I'm telling him to click and he ain't clicking. But anyway, anyway, you may have to do it. I don't know. Uh, Chris, take care of that, would you, brother? Here, we'll, y'all, time out. Time out. Let, let, my man, let my man take care of it. I guarantee you. Thank you, brother. But anyway, here it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Here's the seventh flavor. If you want to look at it this way, you know, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit being one fruit in nine flavors. And nine flavors are listed here. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. And then today, the seventh one, which we spent six weeks on the six previous flavors. And the, today, the seventh is the fruit of faith. Faith is the only one on this list that is both a fruit of the Spirit and a gift of the Spirit. If you look at the gifts of the Spirit in like 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5, talk about gifted people, and Romans uh, chapter 7 talks about motivational gifts of the Spirit. But if you look in 1 Corinthians 12 of the gifts that are listed there that the Holy Spirit gives in order to empower us to do the works of Jesus... One of them is the gift of faith. So this gift is not only a fruit of the Spirit, but a gift of the Spirit. And we obviously see this in the life of Jesus because undoubtedly Jesus de uh, demonstrated more faith in his personality than anybody that's ever lived on earth. If you looked at Jesus' life and you said, what is Jesus like? What is his personality like? What is his nature like? You would certainly have to include the word faith in what he was, he just naturally demonstrated faith and walked in faith and oozed out faith as part of his personality. And yet, on the other hand, if you describe the works that he did, you would be saying, well, his works were works of faith because everything he did, he did because he said that his Father in heaven told him what to do. He said the Son of Man, which is the way he described himself while he was here on earth, because he was as much man as if he was not God at all, and yet on the other side, he was as much God as if he was not man at all. He is a God-man, the only one that has ever existed. Thank you, Chris. The only one that has ever existed on this earth, the God-man, and the only one that will ever exist that was as much man as if he was not God at all and as much God as if he was not man at all, said that the Son of Man does not exhibit what he does based on what he thinks he might want to do. Jesus was not a freelancer as God walking around the earth just performing all kind of miraculous things to impress people. He said, no, I only do what I see my Father do. So when he performed an act of, faith, of miracle, it was an act a faith that the Father put through him and said, my Father wants this work done. So Jesus did what his Father showed him what to do. And then he said, I only speak what my Father tells me to speak. 
You know, we would really like to know a lot of things like, Jesus, when are you coming back again? That would be a, an obvious question that we would want to know, right? That's what, that's what the disciples asked Jesus, and Jesus said, I wish I could tell you, brothers, but I don't really know because my father hadn't told me. He says, as a matter of fact, he says, the angels don't know, the son doesn't know. He said, only my father knows when, when that will happen in life. And so one day the father will go out into heaven. You know, Jesus said what he was doing in heaven right now in John chapter 14 you remember what he said in John chapter 14? He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it weren't so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will surely come again that where I am, you might be also. And the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. Not one of many ways. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Clear statement of true faith and confidence. And so Jesus said, I can't tell you because the Father didn't tell me. And so only God knows when Jesus... I mean, one of these days the Lord's going to walk out into, into glory... And he's going to examine the mansion that Jesus has prepared for us. And he's going to look at it and he's going to say, all right, son, that looks really good. Yeah, that has everything that they're going to need in this life to come. This has everything because, remember, it's a mature father that knows what a family needs in a home, what they, what they need to have in a home, how that home needs to be uh, supported and how it needs to be built and what it ha needs to have inside of it. I mean, a newlywed, uh, many times, they don't know what they need. They don't know uh, what, what that home needs to be prepared like. But a mature father who's had a family for all of these years knows, son, you need this and you need that and make sure you have that. And that's not necessary, so we'll eliminate that. But we need something over here. And, and so it's a father that goes out and looks at the mansion and finally says, all right, all right, Jesus, if everything's ready, go back and get them. And the trump of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise because they got six feet further to go. And when they get where we are, we're going to rise together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord is what Thessalonians says. And we believe that. You know why we believe that? Faith. Faith. That's not evidence of things looked at because we haven't seen that. As a matter of fact, we've never seen heaven. We've never seen Jesus except by faith to believe that Jesus is our Messiah, that heaven is our home, and that that promise is more real than the things we look around and see is an act of faith. So faith is a really broad thing in the Scripture. It's both a fruit of the Spirit as it represents the personality of Jesus, and it's a gift of the Spirit because Jesus did more faith works than anybody that's ever lived on the earth. The Greek word for faith is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, pistis. Now, pistis doesn't give you a whole lot of trouble, a whole lot of uh, encouragement in narrowing down what faith means because it's translated in about a dozen ways in the Bible. Sometimes the word is referring to a body of doctrine, like uh, preaching the faith. What does that mean? It means, well, I'm preaching a body of doctrine that is called the faith. It's just a big word for an accumulated a study of what the doctrine of Christ is about, it, and it's called the faith. Sometimes it, it refers to confidence in Jesus, like uh, everything that Jesus said, I believe by faith. And then sometimes it's used to talk about, uh, uh, talk about a, the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is called, cumulative, the faith. When I talk about what Jesus taught and what Jesus said, I call it the faith. So the word is kind of broad and there has lots of meanings, but, but I've narrowed it down to me. And you say, Pastor, what do it, how would you define the word faith? Well, it would be uh, this confidence or a confident belief regardless of evidence. That's what I believe you could define faith as. Confident belief regardless of evidence. Now let me explain that. Now you may have a lot of evidence 
or you may have zero evidence. But if you believe something, regardless of whether you have lots of evidence or no evidence, that would be an act of faith that you believe something in spite of the fact that there may not be any evidence of that, that you can put your hands on, that you could see, that you could uh, experience, you know. I mean, I, I, give, I give you an idea. There's no way that we, could re, uh, that we could recapture the creation of this world. There's no experiment that we could do that would prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that the world was created like the Bible says it's created because we, we don't have any way to put that in the laboratory and do another experience and have another experiment and have another world be created. We believe that the world was created by the word of God when God spoke and out of darkness came everything. We believe that in spite of the fact that we don't really have any evidence to prove that except that God says it in his word that we believe by faith came from God. So regardless of the evidence, we believe that God created, thereby we put faith in God. So we are believing something regardless of whether evidence is conclusive or whether there's no evidence in things. And so when you believe something in spite of the fact that you may not be able to prove it, uh, that's faith. We have a lot of faith going on nowadays. As a matter of fact, the two major religions of the world, and it's going to surprise you when I tell you what they are, because you're thinking, well, it's Protestantism and, Catholic, and Catholicism. That's two major religions of the world. Some of you may say, well, it's Islam or it's Buddhist or whatever it might be. No, 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 no. The two big religions in the world today, number one is evolution. People are being taught, and they have been for the past 40, 50 years, that we evolved from some kind of ape or monkey or we came up... You know, we were a one-cell amoeba one day that hit the earth off of a burning comet, which I have no idea how an amoeba lasted, lasted on a burning comet. But anyway, it hit, it hit something, and then we uh, sprang out, and from this one-cell little something, we turned into this multiple-celled dominant creature over billions of years or whatever baloney it might be. And, and the, whole, you know, the whole world is being asked to believe that mess. And they teach it in school. As if, it's a, as if it's known, as if it's uh, the real deal. And we have millions of people in this earth that believe that garbage. In spite of the fact there's no evidence of that whatsoever. When you believe something in spite of the fact that there's no evidence, that is a religion, guys. Whether you want to believe that or not, it's put forth as science, but it's not science. It's religion. Second one is just like that, and that's this man-made global warning mess. That is just as truly a religion as you have ever seen in your life. And both of those religions are preached by people who don't believe that God even exists. And it's proved to uh, control the, the belief system of people. And, it's, and there's no evidence of either one of those things. And every piece of evidence that might, be, might exist actually proves the contrary to, what, the, to what, what is believed. So that is just a religion. And see, what I'm trying to tell you is that faith exists when we believe something in spite of the fact that we either have evidence or we don't have evidence, but we believe it anyway, that's an act of faith. When I was in college, there was a phrase that I learned. When I was in college, I had to study a lot of philosophy and a lot of uh, psychology. My undergraduate degree is in education. And so you would think that I was trying to be a psychologist or something like that, as many different psychologies as any of you that graduated with a degree in education know this is true. We had, five, we had to take five or six different kind of uh, psychology classes. I, I thought to myself one time, I'm not trying to be a psychologist here, you know. But we had to study lots of stuff. And one thing I, let, I learned when I was studying for, for a degree in Bible theology and stuff like that is that many times you have to study a lot of things that are totally wrong and contrary to the things that you believe in. You have to read lots of books and do lots of study by people that believe the contrary to the faith and so forth. And here's a phrase that I learned to uh, think of as I read lots of this stuff, and that is, uh, you can get something good out of a garbage can if you can hold your nose long enough. And, and so we had to read a lot of stuff that were like a garbage can. You just had to hold your nose and hopefully and pray, say, God, give me something out of this thing that's worth anything. <laughs> But one of the phrases that I got was this. It, it, the phrase was, a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. 
And every time I think about faith, I think about that little phrase. Faith is like a long obedience in the same direction. That was spoken by Friedrich Nietzsche, who also came up with the phrase, God is dead, by the way. He's a German philosopher in the 1800s. But he came up with that statement, and he was talking about happiness and heaven and so forth, and he said, really what we need is a long obedience in the same direction. And the reason I say that is because this is very appropriate today because we live in a society that is such a, a culture of quit, of quit. You know, I mean, when things get a little bit difficult, we, our whole society today wants to quit, you know. I mean, when we get married, we know or we say we know it's going to be a lot of work in this. We know it's going to be a lot of challenge in this. And this is going to take some real adjustment and some hanging in there and all that. But a lot of times, uh, marriages nowadays end when, when it gets a little bit difficult. Uh, people just quit, you know. I mean, hey, pfft, you know, throw my hands up and say, all right, I'm through with that. And I know some, there are all kinds of circumstances. I'm not trying to criticize you or make you feel guilty. I'm just saying that lots of people don't even give it a chance. They just stop immediately. Same thing with a job. When you get a job, I don't know why people don't think that when I get a job, I'm going to have to really work. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, could you imagine that they expect me to, to work on this job? Well, yeah, that's why they call it a job. That's why they don't call it fun because, because they have to pay you to do it, you know? So when you get a job, I mean, expect to work. But whenever, sometimes when people, they get a job and they find out, man, I'm expected to work, well, they just, you know, hey, I don't want that kind of job. When you take up a diet, you know, you find out that this diet expects me to exercise my body and my mind and my self-control. Then, you know, you walk away from that exercise program because uh, the fine print said, here, you got to do this. And then it always has this little deal about uh, exercising your body <laughs> that you didn't read about in the big full print. So it's a little bit too much work. By the way, I love to work out. I love the uh, treadmill. I was talking with Brent about that, Brendan, uh, several weeks ago. And I said, man, you know, uh, these, older, these older treadmills, I like them a lot, but I really love these new treadmills because they have lots more places to hang clothes on them than the other ones <laughs> that, we, that we have. You know, they got a lot, lot more handles and stuff on them when you, got, you can hang a lot more clothing on them, and so it's really good. But, but anyway, people start to church, you know, they start coming to church, and then they quit. Uh, probably half the people on any church's roll if they have a membership role, probably half of the people on there have never darkened the, the door of the church. Why is that? Well, it's because the people start and then they quit. So a long obedience in the, right, in the same direction would be a life of faith. And that's what God would ask us to live obediently, uh, consistently in the same direction. And a long obedience takes a real faith, what we would call fruit of the faith, so what is it that God says about faith? And I've narrowed it down to five big kind of areas, and I'm hoping to get to all five of these. Everybody say, pray for him, Lord. Because any of these, any of these five honestly could be a whole message just by itself. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to skeet through, okay? All right, I'm going to try to just give you a, a little chew on each one of these because these, this is what faith is about, and this is what the fruit of faith is about. You know, a fruit is something that's planted in you, and it, and it grows. I mean, it, 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 that's why it's called a fruit. That's, not, that's why it's not called a gift. A gift is something that you just simply receive in a moment of time, and once you receive it, you have it. That's the gift, and you receive it all at one time, and, it, and you get everything that it is all at one time. But something that's a fruit is something that's planted in you, and then it grows, and as it grows, you become more mature, and the fruit becomes more mature, and it tastes better, and it works better, and it accomplishes its purpose. So faith as a fruit of the Spirit means that things start small, and they grow in life. So here, here are five truths I believe all of us should know about faith. Number one, faith is our evidence. This is from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We quote it all the time around here. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, and, and this is going to sound like a philosophical kind of statement, but I, I, I want to explain it. Faith gives tangible visibility 
to vague invisibility. I know that, and I know that sounds like, oh, preacher, come on, man. Tangible, what, what that saying is, faith is, is the substance, faith is the realization, faith is the belief in things that we hope for. So when, when I can believe something is going to, to be true about my life or true about what God's doing in my life or what, or what God's maturing in my life, when I, can, when I can realize that, it is the substance, it's the realization of things that I'm hoping for in my life and the evidence, which means the confidence of things that I don't see, that is tangible visibility to something that is tangible invisibility. Now, you say, okay, well, let me just show you. I think verse 3 will lighten it up a little bit for us so we can see it. Now, uh, this is verse 3, same chapter 11. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. By faith, we believe God spoke and there was light and God separated light and darkness and God created animals and God created fish and God created birds and God created man and God looked at everything and said it was very good and that's how everything got started. So by faith, we believe that the worlds were framed. So our, our, our confidence, our realization is that the, all of this tangible visibility around us was created by something that we you know, that we believe happened because we weren't there. We couldn't be there. We have no real evidence of that. We can't recreate it in a lab and so forth, but we believe it, see? Faith is the, is the substance of things that are hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So that, look, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So the word of God in the book of Hebrews that was written about 2,000 years ago is telling us that everything that we see materially on this earth is created by some tiny things that are invisible that we cannot see. You say, wow, what does that mean? All right, how long have we known about atoms? Well, you say, well, you know, and I know if you're a student of this, you might be aware of this, but back in about 300 years before Christ came on this earth, there were some scientists that dabbled around with the concept of this. How in the world they did it, I don't know. I don't know, they had, to, you know, they had no microscopes, they had all this kind of stuff that we have. But in spite of that, there were some theories floating around about how things were made up in the universe and how that there had to be some tiny particles that, that made things up that we can't see. Well, along in the 1800s, there was a scientist called John Dalton, and John Dalton came up with the atomic theory, which means John Dalton came up with a theory that everything in life is made up by particles, tiny little particles that are atomic, that are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and then they all mass together, and it actually creates something that is tangible and visible. Now, we know that's the truth. Every, those chairs you're sitting on, this pulpit that you're seeing or this stand that you're seeing, this, our bodies, I mean, all, we're, we're all made up of atomic particles that nobody can see. So the Bible said uh, 2,000 years ago, the Bible said, let me tell you how, what, what all this stuff is made of. All this stuff is made by God from things that are not visible in, in, in cognitive life. So basically what it's saying to us is, that, that, that uh, although I can't demonstrate certain things and although I've never seen certain things, that, that the reality of those things comes by faith. In other words, I'm just saying because of faith in Jesus, the things that are merely seen or touched or heard or smelled are not nearly as real as things that Jesus promised us. As an example, which is more real, this pulpit right here or heaven? Which one's going to last longer? Well, you say heaven's going to be forever and all of this is going to pass away. And so by faith, what I'm just saying to us is that the things that Jesus said, because we believe what Jesus said, 
In spite of the fact of what evidence there may or may not be, we believe what Jesus said is true more than we believe what we can see and touch and taste and smell because we've never seen heaven, we've never seen hell, we've never seen eternity, we've never seen spirit worlds, we've never seen life, we've never seen life beyond death, but we believe that. Why? Because it is the evidence of things that we cannot see, and it's more real than even things that we can see. So faith is our evidence. You say, why do we believe in Christ? Well, it's faith. Why do we believe in God? It's faith. Why do we believe in heaven? We're going to go one day. It's faith. Why do we believe in salvation? It's faith. And so faith becomes the evidence of things that we see in life. Here's number two. Number two is, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, uh, now here, here it is in verse 6 of that same chapter of Hebrews. Notice it says, but without faith, it is, po- it is impossible to please him. Everybody say impossible. impossible. What does that mean? It means you can't do it, right? It means you, without faith, there's no possibility of you pleasing God, right? All right, so let's go with that just a second. There are many of you that are in here and I know watching that you would never think of doing anything wrong. I mean, you try not to do things that are wrong. I mean, you don't take drugs. You would never be tempted to take drugs. You don't think about taking, I'm talking about illicit drugs. Uh, you're not unfaithful in your marriage. You, you would never be unfaithful in your marriage. You, you have some very high morality issues there. You don't tell lies. You don't steal things. You know, you don't covet other people's properties. You don't try to tear down uh, other people's lives and all those kind of things. And, and you live that way because you live by a certain moral code in life. And your moral code is, I love God and I want to please God in every way. And so I know that I need to live without committing all these terrible sins in life so that I can please God. So that my life can please God because I don't do all of these horrible things and I try to be a good witness. Yet this passage is telling us even though you might live a life like that and you might not take drugs, you might not tell lies, you might not be unfaithful to your family and all this kind of other stuff like that. If you don't live displaying a life of faith, you cannot please God in spite of the fact that you live by this code and you do all these other great, nice things, wonderful, clean things without faith, you're not living a life that is pleasing to God. Now, let me just show you this in a, in a really tangible way, all right? I'm just going to choose one way, and this one is so easy to demonstrate that uh, I think it'll make, it, make sense to you. Uh, every week, as a matter of fact, we just did a few minutes ago, we pray a prayer, right, before we give an offering. We, we have a box down here, and this box is to put an offering in, money, right? All right? We say a, a prayer. We make a statement of faith before we put our money in it. You remember? It's called the prayer of Jabez, and it's from First, First uh, Cr- uh, Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. And it says, it's a little prayer that Jabez prayed. Jabez says, Father, bless me a lot. Expand my territory. Uh, put your hand on me, fill me up with yourself, keep the evil one away from me that he might not grieve me. And then the Bible says, and God granted him that which he prayed. And so that tells us that that prayer is God's will because God blessed it when Jabez prayed it. I know we're always looking for some, something to pray that would be pleasing to God and that God would actually get behind. Well, there's your perfect example. Find something in the scripture that God blessed when somebody prayed it, and there you go. That's a perfect example of what to pray for. But that prayer is a prayer that is a statement of faith. It is saying, God, I believe, before I put my offering in this offering box, I believe that what you said about giving is going to be blessed by you. So as an act of faith and worship, I bring my resources up here and I put it in this box and I put it in this box believing that you are going to make the 90% that you left me with uh, go as far as 100% would go uh, without uh, without me giving it. it Yeah. And so when you come up here, you are demonstrating an act of faith that is saying that you believe that God's promise to bless you is going to come through in life. And so you are displaying or living faith 
before God. Now, I know we talk about this all the time, but I'm just going to read this passage because I, I, we talk about it all the time. And I thought to myself this week, I said, I wonder if, you know, if some people have ever really even seen this passage. But this passage is out of Malachi 3, and I'm not going to, I'm going to just read it and let it say what it says to you, all right? This is, this is a conversation between God and the people of Israel. And it's just one of those conversations that God has, and, and they respond. Look at it, verse, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? God says, in tithes and offerings. And God goes on to say, well, you're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring all, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That's a real promise, right? It's a real long verse too, by the way. Now, all of that is just one verse, verse 10. But God is saying to you, basically, if you'll bring the tithe, the money, the tenth. The word tithe means tenth. You say, you know, that's not even a religious word. It's just a financial word. It's a word about it means tenth. So when you see the word tithe, it just means bring a tenth into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Why? Because we need food. Because we need to feed. We need to be able to have resources to feed out of. God wants his house to be stable and firm and have resources to minister from. And he says that's how we get it is when God's people obey God and do what God says by faith, believing that if they do that, God is going to do what he said he was going to do, which is open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there won't be room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for or your sakes, that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So that obviously and distinctly is a promise from God that if we will obey him, that he will take the 90% that we have left and bless that more than the 100% that we would have if we didn't obey him. So if you get your calculator out and you start crunching in the numbers and you come to the conclusion that there's no possible way for God to give you more in life with 90% than 100%, then you are not living a life of faith. And every time we open this offering box and we offer an opportunity to come down the aisle, you get to demonstrate how you don't believe that God is going to do what he says because you're not willing to give believing that God can take 90% and do more with it than you can do with 100%. So I'm just saying that if we don't live a life that demonstrates faith, Hebrews says without faith, it is not highly unlikely or practically impossible. It says, if you don't live a life of faith, no matter how good you might live in other areas of life, it is impossible for you to be pleasing to God. And so anyway, there you go. Faith, pretty, pretty heavy little subject there, right? Let me go on to number three. Faith is the starting point in our pursuit of God. Now we're going to go, we're going to go to the same verse six because we didn't get finished with it a moment ago. Verse 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now look at this. It goes on, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when I come to God, I've, the first thing that is true here is I've got to believe that God is. All right, so what's that talking about? Well, it's talking about faith being the starting point in our pursuit of God. In other words, when I first come and, and go move toward God, what's got to be true? I got to believe that God is. So you might be sitting here today and you might say, well, I'm not sure I believe in God. Well, okay, you're not sure that you believe in God. So what would the question, next question be that I might ask you? I might say, I might say well, do, do you know everything? And you would say, probably no, I, I don't really know everything. And then I might ask you, well, is it possible that some things could exist outside uh, your realm of knowledge? Well, your answer might be, well, I suppose so. You know, it might be that, that things could exist outside my realm of knowledge. My next question would be, well, do you suppose that God 
might be in that realm that is outside your realm of knowledge? And of course, the answer would have to be, well, it's, it's possible. I don't know everything, and I might not know that God exists, but it's possible that he does. And then my, my last question would be, well, how, is it important for, to you to know whether he exists or not? I mean, is that important enough for you to, for you to put, a little, put a little challenge behind this? Yeah, well, if you're going to know whether God exists or not, let me tell you how, you, how you're going to find out. You're going to find out when you start where you are and you move toward God in any way, God is going to take where you start and then he's going to expand it. And as you move into that area, he's going to expand it a little bit more. And then as you move into that area, he's going to expand it a little bit more. And you're going to be able to find out the truth because you pursue God. You start where you are, which is taking the faith that you have. And let me, let me just show you, everybody has a little bit of faith. Uh, Romans 12, verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, all right? Think with some reality. Think with, with, you know, with, with some honesty, with some truth. As God has dealt to each man, uh, to each one, a measure of faith. So look at your part neighbor and say, you have some faith. You have a measure. You have a measure of faith. Well, is every measure is every measure the same size? Well, no, because some of you have more faith than others have, right? Some of you got a big measure and some of you got a small measure. Some of you got a teaspoon and some of you got a shovel, you know? But no matter which one you got, you have some faith. So all all this all this beginning of faith and going where taking what you have and going to what you need. It begins with taking what you have, whether it's a teaspoon or a shovel of faith, and, and, and using that starting where you are and saying, God, I don't know if you exist. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. I don't know how to know you. I don't know anything about you. But God, if you're there, I, I, I'm going to open the door, and I want you to move in my life and show me that you're there, that you are real. that you, And God says, all right, that's as much faith as you have. Well, you're using what faith you have. And so I'm going to respond to the faith that you have. Now, let me show you the next verse that really will tell you then what happens after that. This is in Romans 1. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God's salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel of Christ is powerful and it's the basis of every belief we have. Look at verse 17. For in it, the rightness, that righteousness is a big word, but it just means God is right. The rightness of God is revealed. Well, how does God reveal himself? Look at the next line. From faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So what God is saying there is if you'll take what faith you have and everybody's been given a measure, your measure may be tiny or your measure may be large, but take whatever faith you have and demonstrate it, and then God's going to take that faith and give you more faith. And then you live that faith and God's going to give you more faith. You live that faith and God's going to give you more faith because the way faith grows and the way you get that tiny little measure of faith to be uh, a bucket of faith is to demonstrate faith at one step at a time. And as you do, God's going to expand your opportunity and your faith to believe because the way you come to know the rightness of God is from faith to faith. And we know that everybody has some light in them because uh, according to John chapter 1, verse 9, put, move me forward, this crazy thing still messing up, buddy. All right, here we go. Jesus, the truth, that, this is John 1, 9. John, let me just give you John 1 first, just a little thought about it. In John 1, that's the passage that says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Everything was made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 14 says, uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, before it gets to verse 14, it starts talking about John the Baptist, and it says that John the Baptist was questioned about being Christ, and he said, no, I'm not that Christ. I'm just sent to bear witness of that Christ that was the true life. That's where verse 9 comes in. That was the true life which gives light to 
half of the people that come into the world, uh, people that live in the United States, uh, that every man comes into the world. So this is what the scripture is saying, that every person that comes into this world comes into this world with some light. That's why no matter where you go in this world, you'll find people believing. Now, what they believe in might be different. Some of them believe in a crocodile. Some of them believe in a rock. Some of them believe in a statue. Some of them believe, you know, in the river or the desert or cows or whatever it might be. And you can find things all over the world that people worship, but the point is not what they worship. The point is that they are worshiping. And the reason why is because no matter who you are and where you are, you have been born with some light on the inside of you that says there is something greater than you in this world. And what you are born to do is to search and seek that which is greater than you. You look at things and you say, there has to be a creator behind all of this creation and he's greater than me. And you're drawn to believe in something. And even though it may be something wrong, you are still dis uh, displaying the fact that you believe in something greater than yourself. And what the Bible says is that, that if, you will, if you will say, God, who you are, where you are, how can I know you, what I can do? If you will do that, God will let you take the next step of faith and then you believe that and God will let you take the next step in faith and all the time your faith is getting broader and broader until finally one day if God has to crash your plane and parachute a missionary in there to tell you you need Jesus Christ, it's God's opportunity to do that and it's not your responsibility to seek him, it's his opportunity to seek you. You didn't find God, God found you. You weren't even seeking God. You were running as fast away from God as you possibly could run in life. If God couldn't run faster than you, you never would have been saved. God ran you down in the midst of your rebellion, in the midst of your sin, and your life running as hard away from God as you possibly could and overtook you and showed you himself. And you fell on your knees and said, God, I, I am unrighteous. I am wicked. I I am, I am rebellious in my heart. God, forgive me of my sins. Save my soul. Come in and change my life. And you did that by faith, to faith, until God grew you up. So faith is, faith is the first step in our pursuit of God. I'm going to have to do the next two real quick now. Because as usual, I have gone on past. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. I've, I've got, I'm going to read the whole passage because it's so beautiful. Uh, we say this all the time, right? We said it this morning. You remember? Yeah. At the start of the service, I said the Holy Spirit operates in an atmosphere of faith. And then I say, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, and you guys say the word of God. All right? So faith is, faith comes not from the word of a preacher. Faith doesn't come from the word of a theologian. Faith doesn't come from the word of an author. Faith comes by the Word of God, hearing the Word of God itself. The Word of God is what creates faith in our life. Click me forward, Chris. But, but Romans 12, but what does it say? This is talking about the Word that God gave to the Jews and the Greeks. So anyway, so what does that Word say? Well, that Word says the Word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Give me the next, there you go, brother. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. That's one of the few verses in life that I have real trouble with. Uh, have you uh, Feet, beautiful. I mean, really, you know, feet. I mean, when's the last time somebody came up to you and said, you know, you, I believe you have the most beautiful pair of big toes that I believe I've ever seen. I, what if somebody said that to you? You'd say, uh, please walk away uh, from me. 
<laughs> right now. But just to make a long story short, let me just mention to you what beautiful feet means. This is actually a quote from Isaiah that said, upon, uh, how beautiful are the feet upon the mountain are, are, the, are of those that publish the gospel of peace and so forth. Uh, what that means is the word, the word beautiful here is the Hebrew word na'ah. And na'ah doesn't mean cute or, or pretty. The word na'ah means appropriate. That's what it means. It means perfectly appropriate. So if you are perfectly appropriate, you are beautiful. Now, just, just hang up one second. I'll explain. All right. Your feet are designed to carry you somewhere. Feet are designed for a function, right? All right. The function of your feet is to carry you somewhere. Now, if your feet carry you somewhere, they are, com they are completing their purpose just like if you, a grape is intended to be eaten or you know, pressed and perform some kind of nutrition, uh, a flower is meant to smell pretty, the sun's meant to shine. So when they do that, they are perfectly fitting because they are doing what they are designed to do. So in this, he's saying, your feet are designed to take you somewhere. And if your feet take you to people who need the Lord... You, and you preach to them the gospel of peace and the gospel of salvation, then your feet are carrying you on a mission where Jesus says your feet are perfectly uh, committing what they were designed to do, and they're doing it in a wonderful way, and they're now beautiful feet. So anyway, that's what that's about. But the point here is, go on, but they, shall, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, so, even the, so the gospel is an invitation, come to Christ, it's a wonderful life. Heaven's real. All the promises. Jesus died for you. The gospel really is the fact. The gospel means good news, by the way. So the gospel is not telling somebody they're going to hell. I mean, they are if they don't know Christ. Don't get me wrong. That's, not, that's right. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Is the good news you're going to hell? That's not good news. What's good news? You don't have to. Jesus died for you. And all of your sin has been covered by Christ. That's the good news. Hey, hallelujah. I don't have to do it for myself because I can't do it for myself. That's good news. So, the, uh, they, but, so it's an invitation to let Christ cover your sins and like he has. But notice it says they've not all obeyed the gospel, which means not only is it a, a, an invitation, it's also a command that you make a choice. For Isaiah says, he, uh, Lord, who has believed our report? Then verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so in order, in order for you to believe God, you've got to hear the word of God because the formula, remember the formula for growing and maturing in the word of God was given to us back in verse 14 by a series of questions that said, how shall they, uh, how shall they believe in somebody that not heard of? And how shall they hear if they don't have anybody to preach to them? And how are they going to preach to them if they've never been sent? That was the formula. The formula is if you'll send a man of God in and, God, and he'll preach the word of God, that that word of God will go into people's lives and those people will begin to grow because they hear the word of God and their faith is not grown by listening to some philosophy and some psychology and some educational theory. You know, the word, that, that people's lives grow in faith because of the word of God. So that means, and I put the suggestions in your, in your uh, outline, get in, a word of, get in a church where they preach the Word of God and they teach the Word of God and the Word of God is on display in people's lives every Sunday. Get in a small group where you can ask some questions about the things and let the man of God speak to you and lead you into properly discerning and deciphering the Word of God. There are lots of things that don't make sense unless somebody who God's called has given inspiration and wisdom to can help you understand it and explain it. Get in a place like that and then have a time every day where you begin to seek the Word of God in your own life and let God speak to you in your own way. All right, give me one more, Chris. But they have, uh, go on, go on. Uh, number five, uh, faith tested brings maturity. This is out of the book of James. You need to know this. If God's going to make you mature, he's going to have to grow you up, right? He's going to have to test your faith. So testing your faith grows you up. Uh, we'll move to the passage. This is James chapter one. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Hey, if you can go to the bank and get $5,000 and it bails you out of your mess you're in, that's not a trial. That's a problem. You can solve it with some money. It's a problem. Uh, you go to your doctor, you get a pill that's going to make your body be okay. Uh, you don't have a trial. That's a problem. 
But when something comes on you that you can't do anything about, that can't be affected by medicine or money or whatever, I mean, if money can get you out of it, it's not a trial, it's a problem. But when you get something money won't get you out of and pills won't get you out of and medicine won't get you out of, you got something that you just got to grab a knot and hang on and live through no matter what and have that holy stick to it and that holy hang in there and grab on and hold on to the heart of God and believe that God, no matter what, he's going to do something with this and all my pain and all my suffering and all of my fatigue and all of my life, that God has a purpose for it and it's going somewhere and God's going to ultimately take this and remove it and I can live like that. That is living by faith. That is believing that God is going to do something. And that's what James said. You ought to be joyful when you fall into times like that because it's the trials of life knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience in you. Go to the next one, Chris. But let patience have its perfect work. It's telling us that patience has some work to do in you. And the work is uh, perfecting you. That, that work, let, but let patience have its perfect work what does patience do in you? It perfects you. It matures you. It grows you up. Yeah, it seasons you. What's the word we use all the time? This ain't nothing but some bread. Ain't nothing but some bread. Which just means we, our bodies grow off of bread, so whenever trouble comes, that's just God feeding us and making us strong. See, that's what our faith would do, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So God wants you to have a life that's strong and mature and you're not shook up by every little thing that comes along in life. You're not filled with anxiety and need to go get some pills and medicine about everything that comes up in your life because, you know, God's working you through it and you're grown up. And if any lacks wisdom, which means you don't understand why you're going through that stuff, ask God. God will give you wisdom about that and he won't throw you down. So there we go. Those are the five big things. There, there's, I had 15 of them, y'all. I had 15 of them that I wrote down. I thought, mm, I'll never get through with this. <laughs> I didn't even get through with Well, I did, but not totally. Uh, what yes, saves sir. me is the fact that he said it's not to the strong or to the swift, mm -hmm. to those who endure. <laughs> yeah, it's not the mighty. That's exactly what. And you are a perfect demonstration of that, my brother. I'm serious. When. Whenever you get to heaven, you're already going to be there, aren't you? That's exactly right. I told Lawrence the Lord was taking his body one little piece at a time. I said, the good thing is, though, when you get to heaven, you'll already be there. <laughs> you'll meet the other half of you. He's already there. Uh, I've always believed in the rapture, but God's doing it, taking him one part at a time. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. And that's grab a knot and hang on. What can we do? And we can believe God and we can have an attitude of a holy hang in there of, hey, I know this looks tough, but this ain't nothing but some bread, and God's going to do it, and God has a purpose, and God's going to take me through, and God's going to... And that matures you and grows you up and gives you strength and stability in life so that you're not fragile and weak and crybaby and mama's boy and all of that about life, that you can be helpful to others, that you can have some strength in yourself, that you can be strong and powerful, you can encourage others, you can, you can, you can take advantage of, of weakness and, and all of that and make it work for you instead of against you. Now, faith does that in your life, and the more you have, the better your life exposes itself, and the more mature and complete you could do. I mean, who likes to be weak? Who likes to, every time some little something comes in life, it just knocks you down to your knees and you cry, oh God. I mean, who wants to be a little weak crybaby mama's boy? You want, to be grow, you want to grow up and be a man, be mature. And I'm speaking of mankind, ladies. I'm not trying to say you can't do this. I'm just saying that we all are like this. And this is how God uses, this is what God uses, that, per, faith, that patience has a perfecting work in you. It makes you mature. It perfects you. It makes you complete in life. And so God offers us these wonderful opportunities, and, uh, and, and God gives us faith and so forth to believe. And let me just finish by, by putting put one more verse up there. I, just, I don't think any discussion of faith could be finished without one little verse, except it's two or three. Run them back, Chris. Uh, one more, forward now, forward one. All right, that one right there. This is Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us. We've, we sing that in a praise song. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you're saved. You've been saved. 
And he raised us up together to make us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Go ahead, brother. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I'm just re I am read that to you because I want you to know that even the faith that it takes to believe in Christ does not come from you. It comes from God. God gives you the faith to believe that, that Christ will save your soul. You can't work that out of your own life. You can't work that up in your own. God gives you even the faith that it takes to believe that God will save your soul. And it's not of yourself. And that revolutionized, that revolutionized the whole world. And I, I, we talk about him all the time. And I just happen to find, you know, sometimes on the internet, and you can kind of read around, you can find some things that are really uh, helpful. And I, I want to read you something because we talk about him all the time. We talk about Martin Luther. You're, you, know, you know who I'm talking about when I say Martin Luther? He was a Catholic monk who uh, in, the, in the 1500s changed the world by beginning the Protestant Reformation. In other words, he was a monk and he believed in certain things. And then all of a sudden, God got a hold of his heart and he protested out and started the whole Protestant Reformation in the 1500s and uh, changed uh, everything about, about the religious world. But I found, what I found was interesting. This is, this is some stuff he wrote in his journal. And I'm going to just read it to you and then we're going to quit, all right? Um, he's, he's a monk now in a monastery in Germany. So he's a monk, he's been there for years, and he's in a monastery in Germany, and here's what he wrote. I tortured myself with prayer, fasting, vigils, and freezing. The frost alone might have killed me. What else did I seek by doing this but God, who was supposed to note my strict observance of the monastic order and my austere life? I constantly walked in a dream and lived in real idolatry, for I did not believe in Christ. I regarded him only as a severe and terrible judge, portrayed as seated on a rainbow. I wearied myself greatly for almost 15 years with daily sacrifice, tortured myself with fastings, vigils, prayers, and other very rigorous works. I earnestly thought to acquire righteousness by my works." That's the testimony of a man who believed that he could work his way toward God. You know what happened to Martin Luther? You know what changed his life? He was going up the stairs, the steps at the Basilica in Rome, and on every step there was a verse written. And as he went up to one verse, that verse out of, uh, that we read out of Romans was on there, and it said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should. And, he, and on there it said, and the just shall live by faith. And he said, I'm living by anything but faith. I'm trying to work my way toward God. I'm trying to work my way in. And I'm just saying this to, to all of us is that God gives us the ability to believe. And if God's calling you life, you'll never be able to work your way there. You have to go by faith. You have to trust God in spite of everything. And believe in God. And when you do that, that is an act of faith. All right. So please, let's, let's just uh, stand at our feet. Just close your eyes.